I don't think we have to worry about social distance. I think we got plenty of room for that. My church does because there's people on the front row. I had a pastor one time. He used to have fun with that every once in a while. He'd have to shake him up Sunday. He wouldn't tell us. You got 11? All right, here. All right. Morning, on a Saturday morning. A little dreary out, but, you know, need the rain to make flowers grow. Uh, my name is Danny Garrett. I am, of course, a lot of some of you may know, I'm the attorney for the Plaxton Parish Council. But in this role, I am actually a consultant with Strategic Demographics, who has the contract with both the Parish Council and the school board to draw the plans for redistricting. This is the third in a series of town hall meetings. Um, if you don't get a chance to see them, you can go on the website and watch them. Um, also, the PowerPoint that I will go through is also on the parish's website. So if you want to take some time and look through it more slowly, you can. Um, I'm going to kind of walk through it. I will go through the, the PowerPoint. This is more about the process and the timelines and what the rules are and as far as doing this. It's, there has been no plan introduced or proposed by any school board member or parish council member. Uh, it, the, what I've gotten back from them is they want to kind of put out what's the working draft that's out there, then get public comment, then start making some final decisions about what they might want to uh, introduce. All right. So, 
The basic steps in redistricting. First of all, you have the census, census 2020. Every 10 years under the United States Constitution, we have a federal decennial census where the Census Bureau attempts to count every living soul in the, in the, in the country. They don't ever get it right, but it's the number that we use for lots of purposes, including uh, the apportionment of Congress, which is already done. Um, for In my adult lifetime, I've seen Louisiana go from eight to seven down now to the current six congressmen. We did not lose a congressman this time, thankfully. But that's one of the primary purposes of the census. Those numbers are then utilized both for local government redistricting as well as the state redistricting. The, state, the uh, legislature is going to call itself in a special session on February 1st where they will draw state legislative seats, Supreme Court seats, congressional seats, all the stuff that they're responsible for. All right. The next thing you look at as, as an individual jurisdiction is whether or not your current districts – with the new census data are malapportioned. And we'll get into what malapportionment means. The next, if you are malapportioned, that means you need to draw your plans to bring them into, into acceptable uh, population deviations. And that's when you start that process. And, it, it, and then after you draw plans, you then have to introduce those plans. Because again, these are, these are essentially legislative acts that will be adopted by the school board of resolution council and an ordinance, just like the legislature will do theirs by statute, by, by act. After you introduce the plans, you have to go through the same adoption process that the entity would ordinarily go through. You adopt the plan. After the plan is adopted, you then deliver that plan to the Secretary of State. Now, there's a little difference. Ten years ago, after adoption, we had a step called preclearance. Under Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act, there are under the Voting Rights Act, there are a number of jurisdictions listed in Section 14 of the Voting Rights Act that said that you had to submit any adopted election law change to the U.S. Department of Justice for their review so that they could determine whether or not they believed it was viola in violation of the Voting Rights Act. And then they would send you a letter either interposing no objection or they would object. And if they object, you have to go back and, and fix whatever they had a problem with. Uh, United States Supreme Court in, 20, in 2013 in Shelby County v. Holder, uh, Shelby County, Alabama, uh, sued claiming that the list of jurisdictions in Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act was arbitrary because when Congress... Four five. Huh? Four or five. No, five is the requirement to, to do preclearance. Four is the list of jurisdictions that have to do preclearance. So what they basically said is they went back and they said, look, the last time the Congress... Um, uh, renewed the Voting Rights Act, they didn't take any evidence, have any discussion or any debate on who should be on the list. Because again, preclearance didn't apply to everybody in the country, just applied to those states and in some states only those counties where Congress uh, had determined that there had been a history of discrimination and therefore they needed this sort of review process. Um, but the Supreme Court said, look, when they renewed the voting rights the last time, they didn't actually take a look at who's on the list and who's off the list and make a determination if that was the correct list, which made that an arbitrary decision, and the Supreme Court basically took everybody off the list. So there, Section 5 of the Voting Rights still exists, so does Section 2, so does all the rest of the Voting Rights Act is there, it's just that there, uh, none of the states are on the list. Louisiana was on that list, including every local jurisdiction within Louisiana, and so we had to do preclearance. Now, I can tell you I was involved in that process uh, 10 years ago, um, I participated in the submission of 32 jurisdictions uh, for preclearance, and all 32 were precleared. Because, uh, I mean, that's, that's what you hire a consultant to do. You don't hire somebody to, to lead you down the wrong path. Uh, so after adoption, you deliver it to the Secretary of State. Um, the important thing is you deliver is electronic shape files. These are GIS files. Um, I did have somebody try to open up shape files that got emailed to them. And they didn't really, they said, I don't see the map. And they said, well, you got to have the right software. It's kind of like you got to have to have Microsoft Word to open a Word document. you got to have Adobe to open up a PDF. Same sort of thing. Then once you deliver them to the Secretary of State by the deadline, the Secretary of State will then utilize those districts for your next regular election, which in the case of both the council and uh, the school board is uh, fall 2022. All right, census 2020. They conduct it from late 2009 and into mid-2020. Technically, Census Day is April 1, 2020. Um, the census is then presented to the president by the Census Bureau that, they, that they've completed it. Now, normally, this happens before the end of the year in the census year. That did not happen this time. Uh, the data was not presented to President Trump, but before the end of the year, and in fact, was not even delivered to President Trump while he was still president. It was not delivered 
until April of 2021. And of course, then it was to President Biden, who had been sworn in by then and had taken office. Uh, Ordinarily, that data would have been provided to the president before the end of the year, and then the president would have released it in Louisiana and, and, and the rest of the country in late February, early March of the following year. So we were way behind. I mean, this is, we were getting the data uh, about six to seven months later than we would ordinarily have gotten it um, in an ordinary census cycle. This was a unique census cycle because the census year also happened to be a presidential election year. Now, the census cycle is always a congressional election year because the census year is always a zero, right? So, but the year, and uh, so that this was a kind of a unique circumstance. Um, but I mentioned the issue about preclearance. In a way, we can get lucky because, because there is no requirement for preclearance, which is a 60 to 90 day process after the plan is adopted, we don't have to do that this time, which means we don't have that two to three months that are also putting a time pressure on on the jurisdictions to get this done, given the late date that the census data was released. The census data was not actually released to the states until uh, mid-September. Now, a little earlier than that, you heard that they used it to portion Congress, but that was the whole state data. But it wasn't until mid-September they, they released what's called the PL data or the public law data, which is that granular data all the way down uh, to a census block, which is the data we use to draw districts. Now, malapportionment. What you do is we take your former districts, and we got those from Gregory C. Rigamar and Associates who drew the plan, uh, who had the de- shape files at least. We, pull, we, we created a map using that. We then uploaded the 2020 census data using our GIS software, and we use, Cal- we use Maptitude. It's a software commercial available by a company called Caliper, and the, you upload all that data. We then run a report to determine whether or not you are malapportioned. Now, malapportioned means are, your, are there any districts that are more than more or less than 5% off of the ideal population? Ideal population is generally the total population for the parish divided by the number of districts. You come up with an ideal. Like if, if, if we wanted every parish to be exactly equal. So the purpose of looking at malapportionment is a, is a constitutional principle of one person, one vote. This the, I give this example. If you had 5,000 people who lived in District A and they got one member on the council, then you had 10,000 people in District B and they also only got one member on the council, well, then the 5,000 people in District A would effectively have twice the voting power per person on the council. So what you try to do is you try to get those two districts as close as you can. That's It's difficult to get it right on the button. So you do have some statutory leeway. Now, there are there are exceptions where courts have approved plans that were outside of that deviation, but there usually has to be a very significant reason to do so. There, in other words, it has to be, you have to basically show to the courts it's not really feasible to do it any other way. Um, but so what we did is we generated that malapportion report. We submitted it to the council. Now, under Louisiana law, there's a step that parish governments have to go through. They actually had to adopt an ordinance declaring themselves malapportioned and directing that they were going to move forward with this process. And because the districts in this plan, which the school board and the parish have the identical plans, they were malapportioned. Both of them are moving forward. Uh, they both have contracted with strategic demographics Historically, y'all have had identical districts between the school board and the parish. There seems to be a notion to do that again. We do work around the state. That, that's not uncommon when you have the same numbers, um, but it's not required. Uh, each of them has their own uh, ability to adopt the plan they want. Our contracts are structured to where if they do adopt the same plan and we don't have to work and do two completely different plans, they actually both get a little discount because it's less work for us. Now, um, Let's see. Oh, let's see. Now, one of the things we also did, like I said, when we went through this plan, we created this report, we submitted those to both bodies, and they were malapportioned. So we do have to move forward. This is a representation of the districts as they currently exist. Um, and that, if you'll notice, the, the, those are, in other words, those were the lines that were drawn 10 years ago that we uploaded the numbers in. Malapportionment numbers came out like this. And notice we're trying to get plus or minus five. You see those numbers are all in the double digits. 
Now, District 1 is somewhat interesting because that's where the detention center is located. There is an issue with one person, one vote involving inmates who, felon in, felony inmates who are in prison who are constitutionally prohibited from registering to vote in our state at present. And that is, if that prison population is statistically significant such that it would significantly alter that one man, one vote, then you redact them out. So we obtained from the sheriff the prison population on census day. And the prison inmate population on Princess Census Day was four. Yes, sir. Was uh, four hundred sixty-eight. Now that's not that wasn't the total entire population because, for example, the guys who were just in jail waiting bail and hadn't been convicted of anything still have complete and total voting rights. So you don't redact them out. So this was information we got from the sheriff. That's why I said it's important we have Census Day of April one, twenty twenty, because that's the date that we that the sheriff went back and pulled that data for us. So. If you redact that out, because the prison is located in District 1, it actually makes District 1's population problem sort of even worse, further off of the ideal. So these were the numbers we were looking at. That's a question you're saying to make it, make it uh, worse. Um, where I'm confused at, and I know each state is different, and you stated that earlier, but the real reason why I applied from Paris had redistricting in the beginning because Arne Johnson literally votes our case. And they did what you said earlier was they looked at the total population of the east bank of the river and they divided that by the total number of the parish and it came over nine districts where each district would have like 3,000 people. That was the original uh, configuration of, of plaque and parish. And part of, and the basic for the real reason was to make it sure that African Americans are not discriminated and will allow them a chance to have uh, African American living. That was the basic foundational principle. So even now, our numbers are different, but the population wise is different, but it still doesn't prevent the East Bank from having a black person elected to the council because the numbers are still there. So if that's the case, and even though to get about the prison number, you know, why is that such an issue where the East Bank cannot still maintain the district where it is, even though the numbers is off a little bit as compared to the pair, when it will still remain, they still will maintain the majority of black districts? All right. Well, first of all, you have you have two sort of competing questions. And, I, and, I, and I'm familiar with that case. Um, but essentially what the court said back then was the five at-large system that both the school board and the parish were using at the time violated the Voting Rights Act. They actually went even further and said that when they moved from the 10 districts to the five, they never got that pre-cleared under the justice, under the Voting Rights Act. So it was pretty easy for the court to strike that down. And then they ordered them to go find a solution. And what, the, what came out of it was the nine districts. Now, and that's why I talk about you look at you have to look at the prison population as to whether or not it is statistically significant. At that time, Plaquemines Parish had a substantially higher population than it has right now. You're right. I think it was around 3,000. In, in the original nine member plans, I think the, 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 the ideal districts were somewhere around 9,000. I mean, uh, 3,000. So they were about 10, 15 percent higher, 20 percent higher than they are currently. Also, like, for example, when we did the – I participated in the city of New Orleans redistricting 10 years ago. They have a prison too. They have DOC inmates. I don't want to well, the prison. The only question to you, but I'm really trying to ask you. Forget about the prison problems. Forget about. Okay. I'm just saying, currently, right now, even though there have been some changes in number, but currently, right now, as it stands, the East Bank still is in position to still have an African American on the Paris Council, and that was the original basic for redistricting because it was in violation of the Voting Rights Act. Why is it that the East Bank have to go to such a thing when it, 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 nothing is in place right now to prevent an African American from getting elected to the council? That's my question. I, I guess I, I'm, I'm missing. There is nothing. I, I agree. In other words, under 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 retrogression, which is a provision of voting rights, Y'all, it would y'all's plan would be if, if it still had preclearance wouldn't get precleared if you didn't have at least two majority minority districts. You still have to have two. Now, why is the East Bank this time unable to be a district in and to itself? Doesn't have enough people. And and the example I gave, and and again, 
I've done this a lot, and I see a lot of people, these issues come up everywhere. When I made a very similar presentation to this 10 years ago over in Algiers, when I was, because we had to do, we actually had to do these same sorts of meetings when we did the New Orleans redistricting. Gentleman, and I, first, first question after I made my presentation, first guy came up and says, I don't care what you do, but Algiers is entitled to its own council district. Problem is, they had about 20,000 too few people because a, a city council district at the time was between 60 and 65,000 people, and Algiers State didn't have enough people. Right now, the, the census population of the entire East Bank is 1,890. Even if you didn't redact out the inmate population, that is still 20, that would, if you, even, even if you didn't have the prison there, that's still 27.67% below the ideal population. That means basically for every four people in every other district, the East Bank would essentially have disproportionate voting power on the council because they would get these same council votes. In other words, effectively, four people in the East Bank could elect a council member where it would take five people on the West Bank to, in, on one of those districts. And that, that's why you have that plus or minus five, to try to keep those populations as equal as you can. Now, at the time that those districts were originally drawn, it worked out that way, that the East Bank essentially was a district unto itself and the population numbers worked at that time, and that's why it was done that way. Unfortunately, the East Bank has lost population relative to the parish, which means the if you can't do a district that's just the East Bank because, again, once you redact out the inmate population, then you're talking about the East Bank only having an effective population of 1,422, whereas every other district would have a population of somewhere around 2,500. So in effect, 1,422 people would have one seat on the council, but in every other district, it'd take, it'd take over 2,500 people to have one seat on the council, and that disrupts that one person, one vote. Now, the council can always say, to heck with that. We're going to adopt a plan anyway that's outside of that balance. It won't be a plan I recommend because it doesn't comply with the criterion that, that, are, that are supposed to be used, but the authority is with the school board and the council. They can adopt that plan. And there are times where courts have upheld plans that were outside of that plus or minus five, but only in extraordinary circumstances. And I don't see an extraordinary circumstance here. A lot of people talk about the river. I can tell you from my personal experience, there are, dis there are jurisdictions up and down the Mississippi River that have districts that span the Mississippi River wow. uh, 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 in multiple parishes. And in fact, I'm aware, there was actually once a state Senate district that actually spanned Lake Pontchartrain. So you, it's not about denying the West Bank anything. It's about keeping the, West, the East Bank whole, rather, and then trying to figure out how to add enough population to that district. And the only place you can go is to the West Bank because it's the right now, District 1 is the entire East Bank. It's how to add enough population to resolve this malapportionment problem while at the same time maintaining District 1 as one of the two majority-minority districts so that you don't run afoul of the Voting Rights Act. So you have to balance. So you have to basically, the, the task is to comply with both one person, one vote, and the Voting Rights Act at the same time. But I, but I, I hear you saying several things. One of the things that I hear you saying is that you are the opinion that, that it wouldn't be out here. But then at the same time, you come back saying, but the council do, still have the privilege to do that. But it, it seems like you're still saying you are the opinion that it won't pass with the uh, with the code. That's I, I'm not listening. I'm I, in this capacity. I'm not issuing a legal opinion. That'll be up to Mr. That, Burris. That, and saying. but I can tell you, what we were hired to do is to utilize the applicable redistricting criterion to draw a plan. And and so. Because, frankly, if you didn't have to worry about one man, one vote, y'all wouldn't need us. You wouldn't need, a, you wouldn't need a, a consultant. You just draw the plan wherever you want. Draw the line wherever you want and say, well, we just don't want to comply with that, with that criterion. The jurisdiction has the authority to adopt it. The question is whether or not it poses, and I can tell you, after the last redistricting, I was actually hired as an attorney by a gentleman in another parish because his parish had adopted a, a police jury plan that exceeded the, the population criteria. Now, it was so close to the election because last time we were adopting the plan right before the police juries all ran. It was, it was in 2011. And so the judge didn't stop the election because we were too close to it. 
But ultimately, at the end of that litigation, the judge ordered that a special master be appointed to redraw the districts that would be utilized for the next election because the districts were out of that one person, one vote balance. And we ended up, what actually the resol resolution we ended up coming to was we just added an eighth district and we were able to, to make the population numbers work. But uh, I can tell you, it exposes you to that vote. Now, again, if it's if you're barely out of compliance and there's a reason you're barely out of compliance, you can argue to the court that, look, this just makes the most sense and 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 we're not so far out of compliance that you should strike our districts down. But I, I don't but I, I would never be comfortable submitting a plan that was See, effectively forty four percent out of deviation. That's what I'm saying. I'm hearing you keep going to I for the Because I'm we're hired as a consultant <laughs> to make a recommendation. What I'm saying is and I have taking time you have to look at seeing if there's some precedent in other situations. I know that initially when the council for Ernest Johnson came, the school board went ahead with the plan. Right. But the council didn't. Right. It wasn't until they started having public hearing and the people say they dropped the suit, then the parents came line. But the school board already went separate from the council on that and the judge ruled in favor. So I'm just saying it seems like you're saying that you, as a consultant, don't want to take the chance because you don't want to lose. But I, I, I'm just saying, what about if we can use those circumstances? You say you don't want to see the river as the issue. You don't want to see the thing. But not you, but your organization don't want to really do it. I'm wondering if there's some precedent out there that's saying that if you use those things, that it will pass and that the court would not see the East Bank still using itself and still in the Georgia district still want to affect the one vote stuff that you're saying. That, that's my concern is that, you know, I'm just wondering what y'all just stuck in the mud of your opinion on it. You know, your personal opinion is, the, is affecting it. It might not be a legal precedent, but just your opinion. That's just where I'm at. First of all, I'm not here to give legal advice, but I can tell you I've read all the cases. Yeah, that's all. And I can tell you, as a matter of fact, waterways do not prohibit districts from being contiguous. Districts that are far out of the deviation are routinely struck down by the courts. It's a constitutional principle. Um, and we are hired to follow the applicable criteria. And if, and if we would make a, re I mean, it would be unprofessional of Strategic Demographics LLC to make a recommendation to the council that they ignore a traditional redistricting criterion. Now, if they choose to do it anyway, and that happens all the time. I mean, I've, I've been on staff at, a, at the legislature. I've, I've represented multiple local governments. I've seen laws that the legislature decided to enact, even though they might be pushing that constitutional boundary. And then I've seen the courts come back and strike those laws down. Now, what I would do is I'd get, I'd give my advice. I give my recommendation. But again, I don't make the call. I'm not elected by anyone. The members of the council and the members of the school board are elected to make this decision. They will decide if they want to adhere to those redistricting criteria. I will let them know what the numbers are so that they're making an informed decision. And so it's, you know, in other words, they all, they all have these numbers. I mean, we've showed them all to all of the members who've made all the meetings. We've had several little meetings with them just to make sure, always making sure we're not violating the meetings laws, but making sure they understand what the status is. And if you'll look back, the after you do the adjusted the adjustment for the inmates, you still have virtually every district is double digit off of the ideal, not even close. These, I mean, this is not a situation of arguing whether a district can be plus five point two percent above the ideal or minus five point three percent below the ideal. I won't professionally make a recommendation that uh, a matter complies with the traditional redistricting criteria. Just like when we talk about utilizing uh, certain the census blocks, for example, I've I've had I've had clients who've asked me, "Well, look, we want to split that census block, and we'll get to the census blocks in a little bit." You can't. You submit a plan that sense, submits uh, that splits a census block. I can almost assure you, the Secretary of State will actually kick it back to you. They won't run the election. Um, now, the Secretary of State. They don't review it for one person, one vote. And in fact, even pre-clearance, the Justice Department, when we did pre-clearance, they did not review for one person, one vote. They reviewed for whether it complied with the Voting Rights Act. And the lit lit uh, litigation I told you about earlier, 
That plan had actually been pre-cleared by the Justice Department. But then the federal court appointed a master to redraw it because it was so far out of deviation. Um, but again, that's ultimately a decision made by them. But my job is to make sure if they're going to make that decision, they make it with information and they know that they're making a choice. Uh, that, 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 and because and, it won't cost, it doesn't cost us. We don't, we, we're, we don't live here. We don't, I, I'm not the, I wouldn't be the attorney on the matter. It would be the school board and the parish council who would decide if they wanted to take that risk. And they could. Um, but we, need to, we just need to make sure that we provide them the data, the information, um, so that when they take that risk, they know what risk they're taking. Um, but again, they, they can do it. Yes, sir. No matter, unless you're here in the parish and you live and see what we go through every day, the East Bank is a, is it a, we're about to be un, not viable with you know in this, in our own community. Everything that we have, we have to fight for it way harder than anybody else. And in our eyes, if we're joined with anybody else that's outside of this community, we lose our vote. Well, and and again. We just, we, we follow what the numbers are. And I can tell you, look, same thing happened when they did the redistricting in 2000 and uh, after the 2010 census, the impacts of the hurricanes. And in fact, the litigation that I was involved in, it was a, 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 a parish down in Southwest Louisiana that had been dramatically impacted by Rita. And in fact, one of the issues was they literally had precincts in parts of that parish that had more registered voters than census population because the people had been displaced, which means they were not counted in that census. So they were not counted for being in that parish. They lived somewhere else, but they had never changed their voter registration. And that was actually one of the reasons the court, even when we drew the new plan, the court did allow them to exceed that ordinary principle a little bit because it was such a significant circumstance. But they could not ignore the fact that you can't just count, you just can't just declare people were not there. First of all, let me tell you this, and, I, and it was funny because the judge actually, Dr. Blair, who's owns Strategic Demographics, was actually my expert in that case. And the judge asked him, is the census correct? And he said, no. And he's absolutely right. The census is wrong. We can all agree on that. The census does not count every living soul in the United States on April 1st of 2020. First of all, that's impossible because people live, people were born and died on that day. And as of today, we are now how long from when the census was, was, co- was closed? I mean, we're, we're, we're a year, basically, from when the census was closed, over a year. So those numbers are always going to be different. But the census numbers are the only numbers we have. Now, there is a provision of Louisiana law that allows a jurisdiction to do its own census and supplant now, again, it would just be used for your local redistricting. It's not going to change the apportionment of Congress because, again, these census numbers have already been utilized to reapportion Congress. California already knows it's losing two congressional seats. Texas already knows it's picking up two. Florida's picking up two. All the states have already been notified. Luckily, Louisiana was not one of them. We didn't lose a seat again. But those numbers are what have to be used by state law unless you go conduct your own census. Um, I've actually not known of any jurisdiction who's ever actually done it because it would be very expensive and I'm not sure that you would get any better result. Um, and look, I, sometimes you'll be doing the mapping and you'll get to an intersection. I had, a, had earlier this year and a, a, a school board member, she was like, well, wait a minute, Dan, zoom in right there. And the census block had a zero in it, that there was zero population in that census block. And she said, that, that's wrong. She said, there's a trailer park at that intersection and it's got like, 12, 15 trailers in it. I said, but the problem is, is those people chose not to fill out the census. I've seen whole apartment complexes where you know, you know you have four, five, 600 people in an apartment complex. The census says they have 42 because they chose, they didn't fill out the census. And that's, that's the numbers we're bound by. And so that's how we move forward. We understand, you know, all the numbers stuff. The, the thing is, is that when they first did the stuff 10 years ago, they were talking to East Bay about using the Air Force Base. It seemed like everybody talking about the Air Force Base and the census. And one of the things is because the people in the Air, that an Air Force Base doesn't vote 
because people do their move to, and other areas do not want to move their residents to where they live at. And so everybody's using their air pools based on the numbers. One of the concerns that I think that, and I'm not saying I think most people are concerned is it's not about us using number for population, but how it affects us in the voting population. Because you can give us numbers, but those numbers also can be changed when those numbers start to be using for a voting population. Because I remember the first tools were using bell chase, and I said, yeah, we can use the airport base, but somebody can go in and do a voter registration drive in it, and then we don't have the voting population that we need to ensure a, a thing on it. So, and I know we're at the area right now with state right at the issue, there's people filing suit against all of the voter suppression laws that are taking place. And I mean, voter suppression is real serious, and it's coming under all kinds of disguises. My concern and hoping is not whether you're from anybody else is not looking at the voter suppression that's taking place in this country and using <clears throat> these census data and all this other historical rhetoric around census data to justify plaque and parish government continue maintain the control and East Bank dilute and East Bank continue to be dealt as a legitimate child. Mm -hmm. That's our position and we know that people can come with all kind of legal rhetoric and, and those kind of things and don't want to take a chance. So it put us in a situation, you know, who we really to trust, you know. I mean, who can we really trust? I don't have any problem. Probably that you, even though you're saying you, 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 you're doing this independent, but you're still an employee of the Plaque and Parish government. You work with these council members. So we got to hope in that you operate from integrity. That's all I'm saying. Well, and that's why I let out this thing. I've submitted 32 different jurisdictions for preclearance. Those are plans that I helped draw. Every one of them was precleared. I take pride in that. And I can tell you there were times where I had people saying, well, you know what, we're tired of this thing. We're tired of this voting rights thing. We, we, we think it ought to be different. Why do we have to do that? I said, you can do it. You can do it without me. And I, I look, what I try to do both in this process and in when I give legal advice to a client, I give them my best advice. They make the call. And I can tell you that in a lot of, re, in every redistricting, there are a lot of people that have agendas. We're the only one that doesn't. We have no agenda. It doesn't, frankly, it doesn't matter what y'all's districts look like to me personally, because I don't vote here. And, and so it doesn't, that's y'all's decision. And actually y'all have elected nine people to the council and nine people to the school board to make that decision on your behalf. And, you know, in my interactions with them thus far, I've not seen anybody, for example, who has even hinted that they were not, did they, that they did not feel obligated to maintain two majority minority districts um, in Blackman's Parish on both the school board and the council. Now, the question is, how do you do that? Because there are ways, there are ways you could add population to District 1 to make it no longer a majority minority district. I would tell them, if you do that, I think that exposes you to a lawsuit for violating the Voting Rights Act. I actually, frankly, used to love the uh, preclearance process because it was a really good way to explain to people who maybe wanted to do something that was that they shouldn't do why they couldn't do it. Um, now, in preclearance, you submit it to the Justice Department. If they say no, you just got to go back and redo it again. Without preclearance, somebody sues you and you pay them a big attorney's fee if they win, and you still, then a judge usually draws the plan, which means the elected representatives are not drawing the plan. And I try to tell them that's why it's important to adhere to these redistricting criteria and to, as best as you can, insulate yourself from having a judge make the decision who wasn't elected by anyone. Um, and, and like I said, the issue has come up with the base. And you'll see, and the issue with the base is interesting because, although you're right, they tend not to register to vote. Uh, both of my siblings were in the military. And they tend not to register to vote where they are billeted. They tend to register to vote. They tend to keep some place that they've been. The military basically lets you say where you're going to be. And, but the difference between them and, for example, the inmates is that if they choose to register the vote, they can. So if you're going to use population from the base to, to, to correct the one person, one vote problem that you have in District 1, you still have to make sure that even with that 
population, that district stays as a majority minority district. And, and, and you'll see from the numbers of the draft plan, it does that. Because again, you can, and that's why I said, you've got to balance both of those. You have to comply with the Voting Rights Act and you have to comply with the constitutional principle, one person, one vote. And that's the balance that you have to find. Do you have the number to show? Yeah, we'll, we'll get to it in a sec. All right, so drawing plans. Again, we, oh, look, I appreciate it. This, this one's been the most active one yet. Normally, I just talk for 40 minutes, and I can, anybody notes me, know if you ask me what time it is, I'll tell you how to build a clock, so I can do that. But, uh, but I'm not building by the hour, so I really should speed it up. All right, we meet with individual members. We meet with members in little small groups, one or two at a time. Um, technology is great because I've actually, this cycle, I've been able to have meetings with people by Zoom because I can share my screen, and they can look at it, and, and, and they can say, well, look, you know, Dan, can what what if what if we swapped out precinct four for precinct three? What if we swap those? You know, and we can do that live, real time, without actually having to be in the same space. Which, from a COVID standpoint and a a time standpoint, is a really good thing. So we work with them, and we will ultimately prepare a plan for any member. Like if a if a member says, "Look, I want a plan, and I want mine to look like this," we prepare it for them. When another member says, "I want a plan to look like this," we prepare it for them. Nothing says you have to have one plan that gets introduced. You could have three or four or five. I think City New Orleans had, I think, six. <laughs> but you had you can introduce multiple plans, then the elected officials ultimately vote and decide which one they're going to select. But I'll draw a plan under whatever priorities people want because there are different priorities. I recognize that even though the school board and the parish want to be together, and in fact, uh, LaSalle Parish is doing the exact same thing. They have historically done the same. It's a police jury and a player. And, um, and they're actually already, they've already in the process of introducing their, their plan because they came to a, they came to agreement fairly quickly. But uh, one of the things I found out when you're dealing with police jurors, they worry about road miles. When dealing with school board members, they want to know where the schools are. So I literally light up the schools to show them where they are. Uh, but we, one of the things we do in those individual meetings is we're like, look, your, your, your district's got to get bigger. Because you have too few pop, you got to move some direction. Which direction makes most the most sense? Which geography that surrounds you is most like the geography that's already in your district, so that it's more most cohesive? Are there any communities like Plaquemines Parish doesn't have any in incorporated municipalities, but y'all have a number of communities. So you want to make sure the best you can try to keep those communities together, because those communities tend to be that it's called a community of interest. Same thing with splitting neighborhoods. You hate to split neighborhoods. Sometimes you have to. The numbers are what the numbers are. And sometimes we run into issues with the census blocks because we have to move data by a census block. But that information is not information I could possibly have. But that is information that your elected representatives have because they are elected to represent these communities. In many cases, they were born and raised in these communities. They know. Look, they know it's, it makes more sense to draw a line at this point than at another point because it, it just, it'll just make more sense to the public. Now, sometimes the numbers drive you to do other things. And this is one of those times, I think, the whole issue of the East Bank is at a situation for the first time since it was really created that it is so far out of the ideal population that there's just really nowhere to go because the only direction to go is across the river. There is nowhere else to go for District 1. So then what we do is we take those priorities we apply these guidelines, and that's how we start this process. Another part of the process in drawing plans is exactly what we're doing here. They Individual elected officials reach out to their constituents, reach out to community leaders to get more input. So we draw the plans. The goal is to get the plans within that plus or minus ideal, 5% off the ideal, so that we insulate you from any claim of one person, one vote, that constitutional issue. We also... The state law says you're supposed to use whole precincts. Now, this is a little bit different situation here because what y'all traditionally do, the council establishes precincts after once it's agreed on where its districts ought to be. And so it's not as hard of an issue. It's, it's harder, for example, we're doing St. Bernard as well. Well, the St. Bernard school board cannot draw a precinct. They can't create a precinct. Only the parish government can. So what they've had to do is they've had to split precincts and their rules in state law about how you can and cannot split a precinct and they have to comply with those rules and but otherwise use whole precincts when they can. Uh, you, again, we move population not by the precinct level but usually by the census block level. 
You see those little Russian dolls, you know, the you know, big doll, and there's a little one in it, a little one in it, a little one in it. That's what a counter redistricting is. It's a puzzle within a puzzle. So Plaquemines Parish is a parish in the state of Louisiana. Within Plaquemines Parish, you have precincts. Within precincts, you have census blocks. And we move, we move geography by the census block level. And that gets very aggravating, and we'll get into that in a sense, because moving census blocks sometimes is not as easy as you think. That's where we get to. So those census blocks, again, we, they are, that's the level of geography that the census reports the data. So literally, there'll be census blocks with zero and a census block with 82 people and a census block with 105 people and a census block with 12 people. And you have to move those census blocks all. And there's no rhyme or reason for how the Census Bureau drew the census blocks. What happened was, prior to December 13th of 2019, every parish in the state was supposed to certify the precincts in its, in its parish. They sent those precincts then to the, the, Depart uh, the U.S. Bureau, uh, Bureau of the Census, the census then, within each precinct, created census blocks. And they drew those lines wherever they wanted. Sometimes those lines were on a visible feature, a road, a pipeline, a power line, a ditch. Sometimes they're just where they thought about drawing, just, just a line on a map. And you have to be careful because when you start dividing, you can move that, but a line, a boundary, cannot be on anything except for a visible Boundary, So it's got to be on one of those census blocks that's bounded by a street or a canal or a pipeline or, 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 or a ditch or something you can physically see. Then the members will introduce the plans. Once they introduce the plans, it's handled just like they would ordinarily handle a piece of legislation. So the school board will handle it as a resolution. The council will handle it as an ordinance, and it'll follow the same process that an ordinance would ordinarily follow through all the way through adoption, including the layover and the publication and the public hearing and the whole bit. What those ordinances will do is they will describe each precinct, I mean, each district based upon the geography. Um, in some parishes, you can describe it by using whole precincts, and here it'll be more of a meets and bounds type of description um, because it'll... Uh, what will happen is the council's ordinance will all create the new precincts and then utilize those new precincts to build their districts. And then the school board will utilize those new precincts to build their, to, for, for their districts. Now, the, there is a limitation on that because you know who else is using those exact same precincts that include those exact same census blocks? The legislature. They're getting ready to go into special session on February 1st. They're going to draw congressional maps, state rep maps, state senate maps, Supreme Court maps, Bessie maps, PSC maps, all the stuff that they're in, uh, in charge of, and they're going to be utilizing those whole precincts. What the law allows a parish government to do is if they have a precinct, say Precinct 5, and there's no way they can do their plan by having Precinct 5 be wholly in one district or wholly in another district. They need to split it into two. They can split it into precinct 5A and 5B. What they can't do is disrupt that exterior boundary because the legislature is using that entire precinct 5 in their, in their mapping. Now, whether they use precinct 5 or precinct 5A and 5B doesn't matter to them, but what they can't do, they won't be able to break it apart because the legislature has to use those whole precincts. So that's really the only restriction on it. But because y'all's parish government and your school board are – adopting plans at the same time and actually run at the same time, which is somewhat unique around the state, they then can draw those. In the school boards that don't have that luxury, for example, in St. Bernard, they actually have to follow the police precinct splitting rules that apply to them, which basically the rules are this. No, no precinct can be split into more than two parts, into, into more than two districts. A precinct split must be along a uh, visible census boundary and no district may contain more than three precinct splits. And if you violate those and you submit the school board plan to the Secretary of State, they'll kick it back under state law. So you got to make sure you do that. Now, like I said, we don't have that problem here because if they ultimately decide on the same plan, just like up in LaSalle, the parish ordinance, which will be adopted first, will create those precincts and then those whole precincts will be utilized in school board plans so you don't have as much problem. All right, now keep talking about census blocks. 
This is from the, the malapportionment map. You see the, the red area kind of right in here? This entire thing, look how far it runs, is one census block. It has 321 people in it. Which means when you move those 321 people, you got to move all of them or none of them. They all have to be in the same district. Now look how long it is. I mean, it would have been a, it would have made a whole lot more sense to take those 300 people and, and probably divide them up into two or three census blocks on other boundaries. But that's not what the Census Bureau decided to do. So we are restricted. We have to move that entire piece of geography, even with this tail. I mean, look at it. It's here. It has got a little tail. It goes way up here. The tail goes way down here. We didn't do that. The council didn't do that. The school board didn't do that. The Census Bureau did that. And you cannot split that census boundary. The Secretary of State will not accept a plan that has a, has a precinct split. I mean, a, a, census boundary, a census block split. Simply won't do it. Violate state law. Now, the other one to the right is a huge census block. And look, it's, it, and it's, it's huge geographically. It only has 82 people in it. So you might, it might make more sense if you just wanted to move this geography right here, this little piece right here. The problem is you can't move just that little piece. You literally have to move that entire census block. So that entire census block has to be in one district. That's where the difficulty some, comes sometimes, where common sense might tell you that the line between this district and that district would best be at this location. But if that's not a census boundary, you can't use it. You have to move by whole census blocks. And there are some census blocks that have zero people in them that are huge geographically. And sometimes you're like, look, let's just add that one click, boom, and it'll light up half the page. It, it's amazing. Even within subdivisions, sometimes the census blocks go block by block by block by block by block. And you go, well, look, to make the numbers white, we just need to add one more block on that subdivision. Click, and it lights up a whole giant piece of geography. And then you got to either move that whole piece of geography or you can't move any of it. So that, that becomes the difficult part because there are lots of times where it makes more sense to draw the line somewhere else. You just simply can't. As a side note, one of the things the Census Bureau decided when doing this census is they actually reduced the number of census blocks in the state of Louisiana from about 200,000 to about 150,000. Now, you still say it's 150,000, that's still a lot, but you're talking about that was a 25% decrease in the number of census blocks. So there were plans, for example, that we drew 10 years ago for school boards. And when we loaded the 2020 census data into those plans, I had boundaries that were splitting a census block because there used to be a line there, but the Census Bureau changed the census block line because they didn't... They, and, and so we had to do the best we could because there's no way to know if you have 82 people in this giant piece of geography right there, you have, there is, there is, other than going out there with a, you know, with a crew, you would have no, there's no data that tells you where they are as of census day. Now you can go out there and find out where they are right now. You can't find out where they were on April 1st. So that is one of the difficulties is understanding it's a puzzle within a puzzle within a puzzle. So you, you have to, and, and you got to make those little puzzle pieces work. And you can, just like, just like if, you know, you're doing a puzzle, a jigsaw puzzle, sometimes you're like, you know what, this piece would fit if I just broke off about a quarter of an inch right there, but you can't do that. You got to use that whole puzzle piece. Same, same notion. All right. So this is a working draft that has come up. And if you notice, I didn't go all the way down at the bottom because District 9 just goes forever to the Gulf. Because District, remember, remember those numbers. District 9 was very much out of the ideal. District 8 was very much out of the ideal. So they both, there's nowhere for them to go really but north. District 7, the blue right here, that's one of the minority districts. So we had to make very clear that we maintained that one. It was also below the ideal, so we had to stretch it a bit. But when we stretched it, we had to make sure that we didn't disrupt its status as a majority minority district. And there were times where we said, we know what, let's just take it a little this direction. Well, the problem is, is those census blocks you added to it happened to be heavily weighted white population, which threw off the balance. So again, 
What you're trying to do is balance those two competing interests up sometimes. you got to comply with the Voting Rights Act, but you also have to comply with that one man, one vote. And it caused District 8 to have to go way up here. Now, these are the districts. These are the statistics from that plan. And you'll notice with and it's got the, I went ahead and included the raw data from District 1 as well as the adjusted data. But if you'll notice, those deviation numbers, and District 1's deviation is adjusted right here, but then that and all of these numbers, they're all within that plus or minus 5. So this plan technically works, and though District 1 and District 7 are still majority minority. Um, so that's it can work this way now does it does this plan ha, this plan has not been introduced by anybody it's just been what's kind of come out of the first round of meetings what i've been told by multiple members is that they want to have these town halls they want to give an opportunity for people to make comment about where they think districts should go then they will use that to go and address what plan is going to actually be introduced so it's very important that if you if you have notions that you communicate them uh, so this would be the map of, of that plan. And notice there's the prison right there. The district, well, that's, that's, this is district, you know, district one is here and then crosses there at the base and takes in a portion of the base. Now I can tell you some of the census blocks around here, like this looks kind of funky. It's because these census blocks are very oddly shaped. And again, nothing we did, nothing the council did, nothing the school board did. The census did it. We have to, you know, like with a lot of things with the federal government, they decided it and we got to figure out how to make it work, right? So, and, and so this is, this is one option. And what it does is it adds enough population to District 1 to get it within that plus or minus 5. Um, Can you back to that? Sure. It's hard to see it from here. So you're saying what area you... The blue area right here, that's, that's what would be added to District 1. Well, and, and, I, and I zoomed in on it, but it, if you'll look, and the reason I zoomed in on it, because if you look at it here, you can almost not see it because right. it's right up in here because it's so small. Uh, but I zoomed in on it just so you could see it. And so how many people are we picking up in there? It, it's several hundred people, but it's what brings, and I'll show you back to the numbers. Remember, let's see. Remember, uh, so let's see. So it got the District 1's population up to 2651, and it was, it had been, it, and after you redacted out the inmates, it fell to somewhere in the 1400s. But the majority of the district still East Bank. And, and we, ha we haven't run voter registration numbers on this plan simply because no one's introduced it. Um, and that's something we can do. We have the ability to run voter registration. Now, again, when you run voter registration, you got to run it by a date specific. The legislature is using voter registration statewide. Uh, as of July 1, 2020, to run their plans. So that's what we've, we've adopted their process. Well, and we have that data. Dr. Blair has it. And he can, run, he can take any plan you want. He can run voter registration numbers on that plan and tell you what the voter registration is in that district as of July 1, 2020. We all know that voter registration changes. It can change daily, basically, um, except on Saturday and Sunday. But you can change your voter registration changes whenever people go in and register or they move or whatever. But so you have, just like census day, you have to pick a date certain and you utilize that, but it gives you a good notion. And just from anecdotally, from what I've gotten from the members, their perception is that voter registration on the base is very, very low. In other words, the people... Yes, yeah, so we used, we, we didn't, yeah, no, we didn't take the whole base. Well, we, we basically, now we had to be contiguous. So we, we crossed the river, went down the, the road, and then essentially bloomed out from there, utilizing whole census blocks until we got to a number that was correct. Now, if you'll notice, it gets District 1 to 3.51. Well, we can actually take that all the way down to minus 4.99 if you want to. So you could actually go into that those census blocks in the base and start pulling them out. Now, I can tell you they are shaped very oddly. And this right here, if I recall, is two census blocks, this whole thing. It's hard to, in other words, it's hard to not, and if you take all of this out, it didn't quite get them there. But again, and you, you can see these on, but we can only take off, certain, we can buy census block. Right. Yeah. And you can go, and like I said, this is just one iteration of how it could work. 
um, as a way to solve that problem. Because one of the things we ran into was one of the notions was, well, couldn't you just run across the river the whole way and take a little bit? Well, that's very difficult because, first of all, the census blocks right at the river usually have zero population in them. So you almost have to intrude in. And the census blocks are irregular in shape. I think I've already shown you that. But they, they are not. It would be great if they were all just little rectangles. But as long as you have a census block implemented into that, to that thing, you okay. Right. We get, is, well, I'm looking at census blocks because that's and that's the that's the smallest level of geography that we're allowed to move. And a census block can have zero to I've seen a census block with 1148 people in it, which to me makes. you know. But the Census Bureau, again, I have no idea how they come to those decisions. Yeah. But at low in population. Yeah. Like, yeah. No, no, no. That's multiple census blocks. I, it's. I, mean, I, mean the block I, I don't. I don't have it off the top of my head. I, I. I mean, I can go back and look at it. But I can tell you this. For example, there are circumstances where one census block surrounds another census block. So literally, you could have a situation where can we just do that? But you can't because it's completely. There's one, and it looks like a little. It's like a little loop. Like you got driving a subdivision and it's just like a little loop. The problem is you can't just have that loop because that loop is a census block and then a giant piece of geography surrounding it is also a census block. So you, in order to have that one, you got to have both of them. I thought earlier you told me you were going to show us where you were getting the event number from. I thought you all... Well, that, well that's where it was. I mean, we... In other words, the, when I say getting the, the East Bank number came from the United States Census Bureau. That's where the number came from. How we got to putting enough population from the West Bank on the East Bank to make the East Bank no longer fall outside the deviation is this right here. But you can't give up the total numbers yet. That's what I'm asking. Well, I don't have to have a top of my head because this plan has not been introduced. I mean, I'd have, I could go into it and, and actually look at how many people here. I mean, I could actually tell you an estimate. Well, what I can tell you is, for example, the adjusted population is 2651, right? Remember, the adjusted population of the malapportionment was 1422. So 2651 minus 1422, that's how many people were on the West Bank that were added to the East Bank. Oh, I understand. And, 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 that's, and that's why the notion, and again, the notion was that the base, although it's numbers, and yes, the base could go, somebody could go into a voter registration drive and convince everybody on the base to register to vote. They still wouldn't be a majority of the district. Um, but that the, the likely, put it this way, if you go add a bunch of District 2, for example, that are already registered to vote, then you know you're adding voters. Right, I'm saying. So you still have the same number problem in District One. The question is, how do you solve it? I just wonder, can we reduce some of those census blocks? It, yeah, we can look at we can look at pulling them back and see what is the least amount of West Bank and that we have to put on. And that's one of the arguments is. Well, well, I mean, it doesn't really affect the pres Paris president's race. But it just it'll affect council rates, and and the thing is is and and I and that's why once you have a plan and you look at voter registration, I think what you will find is the lion's share of the voter registration because we'll be able to pull the the lion's share of the voter registration is going to be um, on the East Bank. Now I can tell you this: voter registration only goes down to the precinct level, and because y'all have really y'all do not have a lot of precincts in this parish, mainly because you don't have a whole lot of population. I mean, if you'll look, like right there, see that 8.2? All of this, that is that is precinct 8.2. Precinct 7.1 goes from here to here. Now, up, up in the north, you might you have some smaller precincts, but you have some very large geographic precincts here. Like, precinct 1-3 is huge. Precinct 1-2 is very large. And so the precincts are don't they're they're not consistent in their size. Now what and, and like I said, you know in a large in 
For example, St. Tammany. I've already I've done their plan. They're get, they've already introduced it. They're going to be looking to adopt it next month. Their districts contain five or six or seven precincts because they're they're they're, they're just so much larger and their precincts are able to do so. But but again, this is just one a representation. But like for example, if you took and this is District Two. Now, one of the things that we heard at the meeting on Thursday evening was. Uh, Repre under this working draft, District 2 would be 2.81% over the deviation. Uh, Councilman Member Black expressed the desire that that actually should be drawn below zero, in other words, into the negative, because he is, he said he's personally aware of a significant amount of uh, uh, development that has taken place over the last year or so, and that drawing it low will be a better representation of one person, one vote. In other words, it's better to draw those districts where you know you've had a lot of population growth over the last year, draw them low using the census numbers to kind of account for those people who have who weren't counted because they weren't there yet. And I've had that in other, I mean, I had, I had one uh, school board member in one of my parishes tell us, she was like, on April 1st, 2020, it was a field. It's now got 200 houses in one year. Developer came up and just developed it lickety split. None of those people are counted in that geography in the census. None of them. Because they didn't live there at the time. Um, so again, District 2 is kind of, you know, around the horn. Um, District 3 is, I mean, and if the red lines, that's the line of the current district boundary. And what we tried to do is try to make as little changes as we needed to make. Now there were some, again, I draw requests from the members to, this is where I think it needs to be. This is where I think it needs to be. This makes more sense. This makes less sense. District 4, same sort of thing. It's not significantly different than it was, but it did have to adjust for some population. And, and understand, there's a domino effect because, again, all these puzzle pieces have to fit together. So if you change one district, that changes the district next to it. It changes the district next to it. it changes the district next to it. And so, I mean, I've, I've had circumstances where I've had a member go, well, my district's at 2.3% above the ideal, Dan. You don't have to change my district at all. The only problem is, is their district bounded a district that was super low. And it was at the bottom corner of the parish. There's nowhere to go but up to your... So, so we had to, to solve a problem. We had to create a problem that we then had to solve. Um, because, again, you, are, the restrict, you do have a restriction. You can't go to Jefferson Parish. You can't go to Orleans. And you can't go to the Gulf of Mexico. And, if, and, for, and because y'all's districts... I mean, think about Plaquemines Parish. It's fairly narrow. It's got the river right down the middle of it. You've got the East Bank, which can't go anywhere except for across the river. And then the districts on the, on the West Bank, really, they can't go west. They can't go south. And, and the districts in the south part of the parish are the, were the lowest, were the furthest out of the ideal, which means they were putting northern or upward pressure on districts. So that's kind of how it had to go that way. I know a lot of people have looked at this working draft and, and said, well, wait a minute, District 8 goes all the way up to Bell Chase. Well, yeah, because there's just there's there's so much less population down in the South. And when I say less population, less population according to the U.S. Census. Uh, Mr. Mr. LaFrance has already explained to me how wrong this census is for the Ironton area. And, and it's not having done anything to do with the hurricane because the census was, but apparently the people in the Ironton area were not, very aggressive in filling out the census. And that's a personal decision. You know, people make that decision on how they do that. Um, and, uh, you know, if they, it, maybe we come up, maybe we'll come up with a better way to do it one day. Right now, they, they haven't come up with a better one. So this would, this is what, this is what the working draft would have district five. Now, six is odd. I've got the northern and southern part. Now, part of this, and because one of the factors that does come into play, some people think it shouldn't. I'm just telling you as a practical matter, it does. And that is, where does the incumbent live? Uh, it is very few incumbent elected officials who have the ability to run in the next election who are unconcerned whether or not they will still live in their district at the next, when, when, it run, when they got to run next time. Uh, it is a factor. It is a valid factor. The courts have said it's a valid factor. In fact, uh, there were two cases that went to the Supreme Court a few years ago, one out of South Carolina, one out of North Carolina. And basically, one of them was a map that was deemed to be partisan gerrymandered by the Democratic po politicians in one state and a map that was Republican gerrymandered by the Republican politicians in another state. 
And the Supreme Court looked at it and said, can't take the politics out of politics. That party gerrymandering doesn't violate the law. Now, still got to comply with the Voting Rights Act. You can't have re- they can't be retrogressive on minority voters. You can't violate one person, one vote. But if you want to draw the districts so they tend to lean Republican, you can. If you want to draw the districts so they tend to run Democrat, they can. Now, understand, when we look at voter registration, you can pull road of voter registration by party. I've not been asked by anybody to do that. I hope they don't. But if they do, we'll, we'll, we'll provide them the data. Because, you know, although it is technically, according to the Supreme Court, a valid criteria, and I think sometimes it gets in the way. And this is somebody who I've been a registered Republican since I turned 18. Uh, and, uh, you know, my great uncle was Jesse Bankston. Does anybody remember who Jesse Bankston was? Used to be head of the state Democratic Party. Jesse Bankston was, my Uncle Jesse was the uh, secretary of uh, Department of Hospitals when Earl got put in the loony bin. And Earl fired my uncle because he wouldn't order the doctor to let him out of the institution. <laughs> uncle Jesse. And Uncle Jesse, he got a little mad at me for a week or so when he learned I was registered as a Republican. But again, I, I, I try to be objective when I'm doing this because I don't, I don't, I don't. I have no idea whether these districts lean Democrat or Republican because we haven't pulled that data. I haven't been asked to. I'm looking at numbers. All right. Then this is the southern part of District D. And then again, this was remember that that really long census block. That's part of it right there, and it reaches all the way up all the way up the side of the river. And that's and it's 321 people. Uh, that's District Six. And then uh, if you'll and and let's see, maybe. See, that's District 6. Let's see, zoom it back in, let's see. There we go. Um, And then District 7, again, it's long. I I broke it into two parts just so it's a little easier to see because it's hard because it's so long. And again, we had to maintain that as a majority-minority district. Um, which is why that's a that's a significant reason of why it looks the way it does. Now it's it looks sort of like that anyway. It was long skinny district anyway. There it ran down the river, and that's the southern part. Um, it had to go go a little ways further than it used to go. If you see down there at the bottom, it had to kind of go almost to Empire because he he was very low. That district was very low in population, and these census blocks over here in District Eight, which is the the gr- bright green. They're huge, and they're out. And they have barely, almost no people in them. But they're out there in the marsh, but they do have some. And then District Eight. That's the look how big District Eight is. Because again, think about it. So District Nine had to push up. District Seven had to. We had to maintain it. So the only, and then, the, and then you got Jefferson Parish there to the to the west. So basically, it ended up having to go up. So that's why it ended up going so far north. And that's the southern part of it. goes down into the marsh until it runs into the purple, which is down there. That's District 9. And frankly, the only reason District 9 crosses the river, there's really hardly any people out here in this area, up here in, the, in this, this corner. Um, like, so that's off Strick or somewhere? Huh? Where is that town off Strick? Where is that? Yeah, it's, uh, well, if you see it's, it's down past Boothville, but it's way, I mean, it's just literally out in the marsh. Actually, Mr. Mr. Cognovich kind of chuckled. We were looking around the map at the census block numbers, and we found a one, just way out in the middle of Marsh somewhere, which I thought was kind of interesting. I don't, you know, again, it's the census numbers we have to deal with. So like I said, this is just a working draft of what could. Really, you could take all that and leave it in District 1, and it wouldn't change District 1's population because there ain't no people there. It's just a bunch of Marsh. Now, like I said, adoption. Adoption is done by ordinance or resolution, depending upon if you're a council, the police jury, I mean, or the school board, and it's done in their for, uh, ordinary process. They have to introduce it, with, you know, just like with an ordinance has to lie over to the next meeting. They will open it for public comment before, the, and then it takes a majority vote to pass it. You can do minor amendments, just like you do any ordinance or resolution if somebody wants to make an amendment, and you can do those at the meeting. Um, I stress try not to do very significant changes because if, if you do very significant changes that impact, that throw a district out of that population balance, then that's a problem. Now, I can tell you when we did Orleans last time, the meeting took six hours because they exercised their right to propose amendments. And literally, they would propose an amendment. 
We, Dr. Blair and I would get, take the computers and we'd go in the back, we'd make the changes, we'd print maps, we'd generate reports, we'd come back out, and then they would debate on whether they were going to do that amendment based upon if we did that amendment, this is what it would do. Um, our, our actual, our software at this time is actually a little bit better than the software we used last time so that I can literally, there's a function where if you want to say, well, what would happen if instead of having that line at this canal, we brought it up to this road. I can actually select that geography, tell the computer where I want to move it from and to, and then I can pull up a box that will tell me, if you make that change, this is how it will change all of the numbers. So we can know what we're doing before we actually click it in place. Now, anything we click in place, we can always unclick. That's not a problem. But it usually just makes the process go a little faster because you can say, well, can you do that? Can you do that? Um, and it'll, it'll show you, you know, if you have, if you have a situation of it's, you have minus 4.1 and you say, well, could we possibly take a little bit more and move it over here? But if you click it, it's going to make it go to 6.2. Well, then, you know, you, you, you can't do it. And so, uh, and like I said, that's just the software helps us with this. I can't, it, uh, um, Glenn Kep, who I worked with 10 years ago, passed away not long ago and Glenn, this would have been his fourth redistricting cycle had he not passed away. Uh, but um, Glenn remembers back when they used to do it by getting in a conference table and getting paper maps and colored pencils and going, well, if we did it here, and then trying to figure out where the population was. It's a whole lot easier now. So like I said, we can do those minor amendments. Now, with regard to adoption, the by the Home Rule Charter, they have to adopt a new redistricting plan not less than six months prior to the opening, uh, prior to the next election. Well, the election's on November 8th, so six months will be May 8th. That's the deadline. Now, there is a statutory deadline that applies to everybody that says that you have to have your redistricting plan electronically at the Secretary of State by 4.30 p.m., not less than four weeks prior to the opening of qualifying for the fall elections. Qualifying is on July uh, 20th, so on it's due, if you go four weeks, it actually comes out to June 22nd at 4.30 p.m. Um, now, certainly that doesn't mean that's when you can adopt it because you've got to have it to the Secretary of State by then or they won't run your plan. Public input. Again, the council made the decision. School board went along with it to have three of these town hall meetings. Um, comments can be sent to either of these email addresses, and I think there might even be a form out there that, that's got the, these email addresses on there. Of course, you can always reach out to your individual council or school board member, obviously. Um, but what they were going to do is they were going to collect all of these comments through the end of the month. And then in February, that's when the members are going to come back with the benefit of the comments that arise out of this, these, these meetings and start trying to move toward finding a consensus to something that can be introduced. Um, again, once it's adopted, it has to be uh, submitted to the Secretary of State by 4.30 p.m. on June 22nd, which is four weeks prior to the open qualifying. We provide it. We provide not only a copy of the ordinance and the resolution, but we also provide it electronically uh, by a block equivalency file. It's essentially an electronic file that's, that anyone who has a, uh, the GIS mapping software can upload that shape file, and the map will get created based upon the electronic data. And we make reference to that in the ordinance and the resolution because that's really the best iteration of what it is. A map is merely a representation, um, and but that that electronic data is the uh, is is the is the most perfect data, and it allows anybody who has mapping software to pull up an exact map. Um, unfortunately, there were some places, some jurisdictions where their prior consultant didn't leave them with that data and had not provided it to them. So literally, I've had circumstances where somebody gave me a map of their current districts and say, "Good luck." And um, I've had to draw it from, I mean, I had to draw one from a map that was eight and a half by 11. It was crazy. So qualifying for the fall elections opens on July 20th. The elections on November 8th. Runoff is December 10th. And so that's it. Um, again, Strategic Demographics LLC, Dr. Blair owns the company. He has contracted with me. He and I worked together with Glenn Kep, um, which is how Dr. Blair and I got together this time. Uh, we worked on jurisdictions as small as the town of Amit, as large as the city of New Orleans. And uh, I even did the preclearance for a home rule charter um, that was adopted during the last cycle. So um, that's kind of where we're at. 
I would urge you, you can go on the website, get this entire PowerPoint from the website. That way you can take a look at those maps a little more closely and um, communicate with your, you know, with your elected officials. That's representative democracy, right? And uh, communicate with them, let them know what, what you think ought to be the priorities. Um, then they will bring that information with them when we start drawing these maps. And my hope is that we get a plan that's a consensus, that we get 9090. Technically, we need five. Uh, I, hate, I hate plans adopted on a five-four vote or on a, on a, on a one-vote margin, but they're just as legal as a plan voted on a unanimous. Um, but that's all, ultimately, the big decision falls on them. Uh, we just tell them what's possible. Yes, sir. All right, so this is you mean the malapportionment? Yeah, the district, district 2 has the most numbers, right? Yeah, uh, the largest, from the 2020 census, District 2 had the largest population. It was 3,325 people, and on the adjusted mal ideal, that puts them 29.83% above the ideal population. So if you were going to take people from the... Uh, uh, from the yeah. Well, and, and right, and if you look, District 2 under the working draft is down to 2633. Now, like I said, uh, Councilman Black has expressed that he thinks that number needs to be lower. He thinks it needs to be, right now, instead of being plus 2.8%, he thinks it'd be better to draw them somewhere closer to minus 3, minus 4. And, and I, as a public policy, that might not be a bad idea. And it would mean contracting District 2 just a bit more. Um, and you would just have to figure out where where possibly you can do that. Uh, again, if you look at District 2, okay, you can't take anything off from up there because you can't give it to New Orleans. <laughs> uh, you, you know, I don't think there's any thought of, of giving it to District 1. Now, technically, you could. You could give District 1 part of this horn. That, that would be a way to go. Now, it's my understanding this population is very white as far as percentage-wise. So you'd have to be very careful if you start moving that population over that you didn't disrupt the minority uh, representation in District 1. Um, so mo most likely, you're talking about this boundary right here with the boundary with 5 and 3 and 4, right around that, that you know, right up below the words bell chase there on the map. Um, you have to figure out how to contract somewhere from there. Um, and um, that's what you would have to do in order to resolve. If you'll notice... See, District 2, District, uh, one of the ways we solved the population ahead is District 5 came into District 2 way up there. Can you zoom in so we can see it? Yeah, sure. Let's see. You see, so District, this, see this, the, the red line? This used to be the boundary link. All this used to be in District 2. Like, it's in District 2 right now. I say it used to be. It still is. It's in District 2 right now. Under this iteration, District 5, because it's getting that, pre, it essentially pushed up. And... But you can move this line further over. I think they drew it at Woodland Highway. They thought that was a good boundary line. But one of the options would be, um, I mean, you could, you could contract it down here at the south somewhere as well uh, if you wanted to make it smaller. So, again, those are just, again, those are just options. Uh, like I said, Councilman Black, he is the elected representative for that district on the council and expressed a desire to, for that, even though he's terminated, he's still, he's still doing his job. He's expected that that district that needs to be drawn smaller because he believes that there's been a significant amount of development there and that there will continue to be and that, that that's probably the better way. One thing interesting, this is a very unique un census cycle. And I say that, I think I say that every census cycle, but this one is particularly unique. The school board members and in this case, the parish council members who are, who are elected, these districts will actually control three elections, 22, 26, and 30, which is a census year, but we won't have the numbers back. So in 30, they're going to run on the old plan. It won't be until 34 that they run on the census, on the new plan built after the 2030 census. So it's very unique in the sense that, and it only happens about every 30 years that you have this, that it falls like this. Um, now, what's interesting is we should not have, hopefully, I say we should not have the problem of the delay in the census numbers in 31 
because 2030 is not a presidential election year, so we will not have a change. We not we not have a potential change of who is president between 2030 and 2031. Hopefully, that will alleviate this the, the the lag that we had this time. But who knows? But it is very it's unique in the sense that um, you know the districts you draw this time are going to control the next three elections here in Plaquemines Parish. All right. Any more questions? Well, thank you all. I know the council members and the school board members appreciate you all coming out. And um, like I said, this entire PowerPoint is on both the school board website and the parish's website. Um, so you can go and look at it in more detail. Thank you all. How are you?